day. I wish I may never stir if it wasn't. Well, then why didn't you say it? Why did you come swelling around that way for and trying to raise trouble? Well, I didn't come swelling around, Mr. Arkansas. I just, I'm a liar, am I? Great Caesar's ghost. Oh, please, Mr. Arkansas. I never meant such a thing as that. I wish I may die if I did. All the boys will tell you that I've always spoke well of you and respected you more than any man in the house. Ask Smith. Ain't it so, Smith? Didn't I say no longer ago than last night that for a man that was a gentleman all the time, in every way you took him, give me Arkansas. I'll leave it to any gentleman here if them weren't the very words I used. Come now, Mr. Arkansas, let's take a drink. Let's shake hands and take a drink. Come up, everybody. It's my treat. Come up, Bill, Tom, Bob, Scotty. Come up. I want you all to take a drink with me in Arkansas. Old Arkansas, I call him. Bully old Arkansas. Give me your hand again. Look at him, boys. Just take a look at him. There stands the whitest man in America. And the man that denies it has got to fight me, that's all. Give me that old flipper again. They embraced with drunken affection on the landlord's part and unresponsive toleration on the part of Arkansas, who bribed by a drink was disappointed of his prey once more. But the foolish landlord was so happy to have escaped butchery that he went on talking when he ought to have marched himself out of danger. Consequence was that Arkansas shortly began to glower upon him dangerously, and presently said, Landlord, will you please make that remark over again, if you please? I was a saying to Scotty that my father was upwards of eighty year old when he died. Was that all that you said? Yes, that was all. Didn't say nothing but that? No, nothing then an uncomfortable silence. Arkansas played with his glass a moment, lolling on his elbows on the counter. Then he meditatively scratched his left shin with his right boot while the awkward silence continued. But presently he loafed away toward the stove, looking dissatisfied, roughly shouldered two or three men out of a comfortable position, occupied it himself, gave a sleeping dog a kick that sent him howling under a bench, then spread his long legs and his blanket coat tails apart and proceeded to warm his back. In a little while he fell to grumbling to himself, and soon he slouched back to the bar and said, Landlord, what's your idea for raking up old personalities and blowing about your father? Ain't this company agreeable to you? Ain't it? If this company ain't agreeable to you, perhaps we'd better leave. Is that your idea? Is that what you're coming at? Why, bless your soul, Arkansas. I weren't thinking of such a thing. My father and my mother. Landlord, don't crowd a man. Don't do it. If nothing will do you but a disturbance, out with it like a man. <clears throat> but don't rake up old bygones and fling them in the teeth of a passel of people that wants to be peaceable if they could get a chance. What's the matter with you this morning, anyway? I never seen a man carry on, so. Arkansas, I really didn't mean no harm, and I won't go on with it if it's unpleasant to you. I reckon my liquor's got into my head, and what with a flood and having so many to feed and look out for. So that's what's a rankling in your heart, is it? You want us to leave, do you? There's too many of us. You want us to pack up and swim, is that it? Come. Please be reasonable, Arkansas. Now you know that I ain't the man to... Are you a-threatening me? Are you? By George, the man don't live that can scare me. Don't you try to come that game, my chicken, because I can stand a good deal, but I won't stand that. Come out from behind that bar till I clean you. You want to drive us out, do you, you sneaking underhanded hound? Come out from behind that bar. I'll learn you to bully and badger and browbeat a gentleman that's forever trying to befriend you and keep you out of trouble. Please, Arkansas, please don't shoot. If there's got to be bloodshed. Do you hear that, gentlemen? Do you hear him talk about bloodshed? So it's blood you want, is it, you raven desperado? 
You made up your mind to murder somebody this morning. I know it did perfectly well. I'm the man, am I? It's me you're going to murder, is it? But you can't do it. Thought I'd get out ch one chance first, you thieving, black-hearted, white-livered son of a nigger. Draw your weapon. With that, Arkansas began to shoot, and the landlord to clamor over benches, men in every sort of obstacle and a frantic desire to escape. In the midst of the wild hubbub, the landlord crashed through a glass door, and as Arkansas charged after him, the landlord's wife suddenly appeared in the doorway and confronted the desperado with a pair of scissors. Her fury was magnificent. With head erect and flashing eyes, she stood a moment and then advanced with her weapon raised. The astonished ruffian hesitated and then fell back a step. She followed. She backed him step by step into the middle of the bar room, and then, while the wondering crowd closed up and gazed, she gave him such another tongue lashing as never a cowed and shamefaced braggart got before, perhaps. As she finished and retired victorious, a roar of applause shook the house, and every man ordered drinks for the crowd in one and the same breath. The lesson was entirely sufficient. The reign of terror was over, and the Arkansas domination broken for good. During the rest of the season of island captivity, there was one man who sat apart in a state of permanent humiliation, never mixing in any quarrel or uttering a boast, and never resenting the insults the once cringing crew now constantly leveled him, leveled at him, and that man was Arkansas. By the fifth or sixth morning, the waters had subsided from the land, but the stream in the old riverbed was still high and swift, and there was no possibility of crossing it. On the eighth, it was still too high for an entirely safe passage, but life in the inn had become next to insupportable by reason of the dirt, drunkenness, fighting, etc., and so we made an effort to get away. In the midst of a heavy snowstorm, we embarked in a canoe. Taking our saddles aboard and towing our horses after us by their halters, the Prussian Ollendorf was in the bow with a paddle. Baloo paddled in the middle, and I sat in the stern holding the halters. When the horses lost their footing and began to swim, Ollendorf got frightened, for there was great danger that the horses would make our aim uncertain. And it was plain that if we failed to land at a certain spot, the current would throw us off and almost surely cast us into the main Carson, which was a boiling tor torrent now. Such a catastrophe would be death, in all probability, for we would be swept to sea in the sink, or overturned and drowned. We warned Ollendorf to keep his wits about him and handle himself carefully, but it was useless. The moment the bow touched the bank, he made a spring and the canoe whistled upside down in ten-foot water. Ollendorf seized some brush and dragged himself ashore, but Baloo and I had to swim for it encumbered with our overcoats. But we held on to the canoe, and although we were washed down nearly to the Carson, we managed to push the boat ashore and make a safe landing. We were cold and water-soaked, but safe. The horses made a landing, too, but our saddles were gone, of course. <coughs> we tied the animals in the sagebrush, and there they had to stay for 24 hours. We bailed out the canoe and ferried over some food and blankets for them, but we slept one more night in the inn before making another venture on our journey. The next morning it was snow it was still snowing fur furiously when we got away with our new stock of saddles and accoutrements. We mounted and started. The snow lay so deep on the ground that there was no sign of a road perceptible, and the snowfall was so thick that we could not see more than a hundred yards ahead, else we could have guided our course by the mountain ranges. The case looked dubious, but Ollendorf said his instinct was as sensitive as any compass and that he could strike a bee line for Carson City and never diverge from it. 
He said that if he were to struggle a single point out of the true line, his instinct would assail him like an outraged conscience. Consequently, we dropped into his wake, happy and content. For half an hour we poked along warily enough, but at the end of that time we came upon a fresh trail, and Allendorf shouted proudly, I knew I was as dead certain as a compass, boys. Here we are, right in somebody's track that will hunt this way for us without any trouble. 